Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm Zach Peterson. I'm a technical consultant with Altium. And today we're gonna to continue talking about a topic that we started on a little bit ago and we're gonna wrap it up today. And this topic is input impedance and specifically how it relates to termination in transmission lines and in circuits. So this was inspired by a viewer question that was sent into our Q&A. And I wanted to look at this one specifically because it is an interesting question. And it is something that comes up when you're working in R RF PCBs. So let's go ahead and dig into it and get started. Okay, so before we get started, I want to look at a question that was sent in by one of our viewers, Muhammad Ahmad. Hi, sir. Your video tutorials are really nice and helpful. Please answer the following questions. And he goes into a question about microstrip transmission lines and using a pie matching filter along the line. Now this is typical in RF interconnects and specifically what he's doing here in this image is he has what looks like a feed line for a Bluetooth antenna and this BLE line is being matched with a, looks like a pie filter going along this loop here. And then we've got a capacitor here, it looks like for AC coupling uh, going into the antenna feed line. So this is all in a coplanar arrangement. The question says, normally the footprints of the lump components such as capacitors, inductors, or resistors are more thicker than the trace width, for example, in the below circuit. And here he's saying he has to control the impedance of this particular coplanar waveguide trace. So what this question is actually asking is, how do you maintain controlled impedance on a transmission line or a coplanar waveguide in this case, when you have to put some components along the transmission line for purposes like impedance matching or filtering? This is a case where in this particular question, we're looking at a pie matching filter, but you might also come across this in AC coupling caps, so such as on like a PCIe trace. That's what we're gonna look at today. So to answer this question, we need to look back at the concept of input impedance. The question here is, we have a discontinuity uh, along the transmission line, and we wanna know how does this discontinuity, in this case, in the form of some component, affect the input impedance? So if we go back to the input impedance equation, we have Z, in equals a characteristic impedance, and then it's multiplied by this big fraction. So here, here we have the load impedance, again, the characteristic impedance. Here we have the hyperbolic tangent function, and inside the hyperbolic tangent function, we have an important quantity. We have our propagation constant, and then the length of this section. Here we just kind of swap ZL and Z sub zero. This is our equation for input impedance. So what this means is that if I have a driver IC and it is connected to a transmission line and then here I have my load. Here, right at this input, looking this direction into the load, there will be some input impedance, which we call Z sub L, which is the load impedance. So this is the impedance that our traveling signal sees when it reaches the load end of the line. Then our transmission line here has an impedance Z sub zero. So this is the characteristic impedance. The input impedance is seen right here, Z sub in. So this is the impedance that the signal experiences right as it's injected into this transmission line and it begins traveling towards the load. So this is the first equation that we have to start with because in order to explain the question, what essentially we're doing is we're now taking out this IC, we're putting in some other component here and I'll actually draw it in a different color. So we're putting some other component here. Let's just say, let's just say for sake of argument, it's a capacitor. We have another section of transmission line and we're back to our original I see. Each of these sections of transmission line has some characteristic impedance. And then this component here, again, let's just say it's a capacitor, has its own impedance, Z sub C. So now the question here is, how do we ensure that the input impedance, Z sub in, in this case, matches the impedance we would expect to see if we didn't have this component here along the transmission line. So that's essentially what the question is here. And the idea here is that this input impedance that's seen at the driver should be whatever the desired impedance target was. So in the case of the question, we're most likely dealing with 50 ohms. In order to ensure that we have a 50 ohm impedance, we need to look at what is the size of this capacitor in relation to 
the span of this signal as it starts traveling down the transmission line. So I wanna just look at this a little more clearly. So I've erased all the other stuff on the board for the moment. Now, let's just consider what happens when you know we have our characteristic impedance Z sub zero, and then our signal travels to the load and interacts with an input impedance seen at the load of Z sub L. The input impedance that is experienced from this section of the line forward is gonna be the previous Z sub in equation that we had written up on the board. What that means is that we wanna make sure that the input impedance here at the beginning of this component does not modify the input impedance seen right here at the end of this component. So I'm gonna give you the answer now, and hopefully when I write out the, the math on the board, you'll kind of be able to see this, but essentially the answer is that if this component is very small compared to either the rise time of the signal in the case of a digital signal, so this distance traveled by the signal during its rise time, or the wavelength of the signal in the case of an RF signal, and this is uh, you know something contemporary in RF design, so if this is much smaller than the wavelength, then the capacitor or whatever you know component is here is gonna essentially be invisible to the signal that's traveling down this line. So it's gonna be like the capacitor doesn't even exist. Now what we wanna do is we wanna look at what is the input impedance here on the left side of this portion of the interconnect. So we're looking at this point into this direction. So we're just gonna call the input impedance seen right here Z sub in two. So remember, the cap has some characteristic impedance of itself, Z sub C. So it's just gonna be the typical capacitor impedance equation. And then here, this entire thing now becomes our new Z sub L, our load impedance. So we have another input impedance equation for section two, which is just gonna be Z sub C divided by, and then we're gonna fill in the blanks in the previous equation with our Z sub L and then our other terms that are in this arrangement here. And so what we're gonna end up seeing is that we'll have a similar fraction. And if the length or the size, I should say, of this component is very small, what's actually gonna happen is you're just gonna to reduce to this low in this equation. So we're gonna have a Z sub L plus Z sub C. And so remember, the signal has to actually physically travel across this component. So there will be some propagation constant, gamma sub C, inside this hyperbolic tangent function. So same thing here. So I've just filled in all the blanks in the regular input impedance equation. So we're dealing with the green Z sub low here, and then we're dealing with the green Z sub C here. And we need to worry about the gamma sub C. Now, what about the length? Well, this length here, and we'll just call it L sub C just for the moment, inside this equation is literally the physical length of this component. So if this is very small compared to the wavelength corresponding to this propagation constant, what happens to the argument in this hyperbolic tangent function? Well, this argument is very small and approaches zero. That means this argument here is very small and also approaches zero. And so if you remember your definition for hyperbolic tangent function, you will know that hyperbolic tangent of zero is zero. So this goes away, this goes away, this goes away, this goes away, because these two will cancel, and you are left with, ta-da, the input impedance at this point is just equal to the input impedance you would have seen anyways at this point. So that's where this is now important, is the size of the capacitor, if small enough, is essentially going to be invisible and is not necessarily going to affect the impedance of your desired signal that you are trying to send down this interconnect. So this essentially acts like a very small transmission line. And this whole section essentially acts like your load. Since this section is very small, it actually doesn't affect the input impedance of your desired signal. So even if your desired signal is at a very high frequency, has a small wavelength, as long as this component is small enough, it's not going to affect the operation of the entire interconnect. I've erased everything on the board just to kind of clear everything up. So now what we want to look at is what happens when I have my driver and then I have the transmission line coming out and then I have some component here. So again, maybe it's just our, our capacitor or maybe it's some other component. And then we have the transmission line going off to our 
load. So there will be some input impedance along this whole section of the transmission line. And when the signal comes out from our driver, it's going to see some input impedance, we'll call this section two, of this entire section of transmission line plus the load plus whatever this component is plus this trace. When we have an arrangement like this, the input impedance seen here in this section, so input impedance red, becomes the load for the input impedance here at the driver. And then same thing if we're right here and looking this direction. So the input impedance here at the green arrow, C sub in, is gonna be composed of the characteristic impedance Z sub zero plus whatever the load impedance is Z sub L. So these two will combine to produce this input impedance for the green. Then all of this stuff is gonna combine to produce the input impedance for the red portion seen right here. And then this, all of this stuff is gonna combine to produce the load impedance that is used here for the blue. Let's write out what the input impedance is for this blue line. So we'll just kind of keep it simple here because we're just gonna fill in stuff in the input impedance equation. So here I have a transmission line with characteristic impedance Z sub zero. So this is gonna be equal to Z sub zero. So remember, this is just this Z sub zero. And then we have our same fraction here. So now remember red Z sub in becomes our load that was in the input impedance equation. So I'll just write Z sub in. And then if you remember, we had a Z sub in down here as well. And then we'll just fill in the other stuff. So Z sub zero plus Z sub zero, and then we also have our hyperbolic tangent for some propagation constant times the length. And so this propagation constant, let's put a zero here, is gonna be the same propagation constant along this section of trace. Same thing down here, gamma sub zero L. And so this L is this portion here. So the first part of the question is where do I put this cap? Because if we can answer that question, that's gonna help us answer where do we put any of the other components that might go into this circuit to ensure that whatever this input impedance is for this entire section is not modified. So what we can actually immediately see is that if this quantity is very small, such that it goes to zero, same thing down here, such that this goes to zero, well, what happens? We have hyperbolic tangent of zero, so this goes away, this goes away, and then these two cancel out, and I'm just left with Z sub in two equals whatever this impedance is here, seen at this interface, is just equal to Z sub in. So this is one of the reasons why, if you have an interconnect with AC coupling caps, you have to put the caps very close to either the driver or the receiver, one or the other, depending on what's in the standard or whatever you test and find out works best for your interconnect. But you need to put it very close. And the reason is that if this length is very short, this length of trace will not modify the input impedance seen going this direction into the interconnect. So that's very important. Let's just modify this a little bit. And let's suppose that we now have another section of line right here. And then we have another cap or another component or whatever it may be. And then this comes down and goes to our load. Well, we can essentially continue creating these chains of, com of uh, input impedance equations through induction. So what you can see, or what you should be able to see, is that as we start here and work backwards, the input impedance in this section becomes the load for the previous section. And then this input impedance becomes the load for this section where you then can calculate the input impedance, okay? So it keeps working backwards and keeps working backwards. There's an article that we're gonna to link to in the description that actually shows the mathematical technique that kind of builds on this, and it has some good diagrams in there that are honestly a little bit prettier than what I've drawn on the board. But those diagrams will kind of help you see how you construct these kind of chains of input impedances for transmission lines when you have these cascaded sections like this going down an interconnect. And so the moral of the story is this, you know, if you have to create something like a pie filter along an interconnect like this, what you need to do is make sure that this distance L is much smaller than the wavelength lambda, since we're dealing with an RF 
concept here, is much smaller than the wavelength of the signal that's traveling along this interconnect. So that's the real important condition here. So just like with an AC coupling cap, let's say in a digital circuit that you put very close to this IC, you wanna then put in an RF circuit the caps or you know the, the inductors or whatever other components you're gonna use for filtering, you wanna put them very close together as well. That way this section of trace will not modify the input impedance. Here, the question also asked about like what if we have you know thick pads, something like this. And you can actually see that in the image that was provided in the question. So what happens if we have some pads here? Well, these pads are generally very small, just in terms of this, you know, the length along this direction. So again, we generally don't need to worry about them. Re realistically, we worry a lot more about this total length instead of just this section and just this section and the, just this section. Now, it is true that if you were to say, you know, treat this width of trace or with this width of copper as a transmission line section, you could calculate an impedance for it. And this small section of line is gonna have some characteristic impedance. We'll just call it, uh, we'll just call it Z sub P for you know, the pad. But it's so short that it's not gonna modify the input impedance seen along this propagation direction. So for the pads and for you know, these small sections of line, you really don't need to worry about it until you start getting into like the tens of gigahertz range. And that's where it really starts to matter. If you actually just calculate like what the, you know, 10% wavelength limit is for like say, a, you know, Wi-Fi signal, 5.8 gigahertz, let's say, it's actually gonna be much longer than what you would practically deal with with most components in a PCB. So if you're using small components for your filtering, let's say you're using 0402, and you connect them together with very short pieces of copper, you're gonna be fine. You're not gonna to have to worry about how any of this copper modifies the input impedance. If you're working with something like radar, it's gonna be a little bit different. However, what RF designers sometimes do when they have to deal with these types of issues with input impedance is instead of using discrete components, they use very specialized components that provide the same effects or the same filtering effects, but without having to rely on these different transmission line sections that will then modify the input impedance looking down the interconnect. So that's a concept that we're gonna look at in some other videos, some different RF circuits and some different printed circuits that you can use in RF design, rather than having to go the route of discrete circuits. But if you're working in the ISM band or you're working with, let's say, you know, Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi or lower frequencies. Uh, usually, you don't have to worry about this as long as you put stuff close together. All right, everybody. So I know all of this stuff on the board is super messy and all of that, but go check out the links in the description because there's a blog post in the description on input impedance specifically for cascaded networks. Hopefully, explains this in a little better detail and it has some better diagrams that you can actually look at to help you kind of follow along with what I'm saying here. All right, everybody, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you'd like to see more of these videos, hit that subscribe button and leave your comments in the comment section. Leave your questions in the comment section. Coming up, we're gonna have our Q&A video going live. Also, we just recently did a podcast with Eric Bogatin. Definitely go check that out. We've got more interesting podcasts and interviews coming up, so be sure to check back on the channel. And definitely, don't forget to call your fabricator. Yeah.